Dr. Holly Howard Parker was raised in Kinston, North Carolina, and was a 1991 graduate of Kinston High School. She attended North Carolina State University on a Caldwell Scholarship and received a double major in chemistry and biochemistry with a minor in French in 1995. Dr. Parker received her medical degree from East Carolina University School of Medicine, where she was an honorary marshal for the 1998 graduation ceremony and was a, a 1999 graduate. She completed family, her family medicine <clears throat> residency training through the Medical College of Virginia. Her, the program was located at Riverside Regional Medical Center in Newport News in 2002. Dr. Parker worked for one year at the Newport News Health Department while her husband, Dr. John Ashley Parker, finished his last year of residency. She practiced medicine with a group in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina from 2003 until 2016. She and her husband started Freedom Family Medicine, a direct primary care practice in 2016. She is a diplomat of the American Board of Family Medicine and is currently pursuing certification in functional medicine. She also works as a medical consultant for Carolina Hemp Products in Kinston, North Carolina. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her family and her husband. She has five children, so she's wow. busy in her spare time. She loves gardening and church activities. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Holly. I'm going to try to work this mouse thing here. Okay. I'm going to be talking today about cannabis sativa. And I'm really kind of fly through this lecture and hit the how points so that we have time for questions since we have a smaller group. Um, and then I can specifically direct that to whatever your um, needs are. Okay, so here we go. Um, this is just a disclaimer that these are not pharmaceutical medications we're talking about. So the FDA has not approved them as pharmaceutical medications. And we are not trying to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure any disease. If you have... Um, medical conditions, you should always talk to your personal physician about that. And don't consider this to be advice in place of your um, physician. This is my family. Those are my kids. Aww, my like family. And okay, so I'm already hearing that um, this rings true to some people, that your doctor may not be interested in discussing this topic with you for many reasons. Um, number one, there are years of stigma associated with hemp marijuana. Um, a lot of people don't know the difference. Um, I had never even heard of hemp a few years ago. Um, most physicians know nothing of this subject. There are no pharmaceutical representatives. It is not taught in medical schools. It is not allowed to be spoken of at medical conferences. Um, most physicians in a regular model we have here in the United States do not have time in a five or 10 minute visit to really do the research and discuss this with you. Um, there are not any, well, there are a few, but not very many multi-million dollar, what we call double-blind placebo-controlled trials like you have with some of the FDA-approved pharmaceutical meds. Um, but there are about 20,000 studies on cannabis products. They're just not necessarily double-blind placebo-controlled. Um, there have been you know, battles over the past few years in legality, so it's only been legal for a few years now. And... Um, in allopathic medicine, there's just a general rejection of alternative therapies. We are not taught alternative therapies in medical school. Um, that is something that if you wish to learn about, you have to do an additional training in. Um, but it is becoming more accepted, and you just get no training in it. So they really just, your physician probably just can't answer your questions. Um, <clears throat> why I use CBD in my practice? Well, I have a slightly different practice model. So I kind of abandoned the standard American model where you have to see a patient every three to five minutes. And my husband and I started a different type of practice where we can spend three to five minutes to an hour with our patients. So um, I have a lot more time available. Um, I also, since I work part time, I have been able to spend time doing research on this, um, pulling studies. I have a lot of personal interest in it um, for my own personal use and other family members who had medical issues that we thought CBD might address. Um, there has been extensive research, it's just a matter of Googling it. It's so easy to find and the literature is out there. Um, after I tried these products for myself and it helped me immensely, I wanted to be able to offer it to my patients. I have quite a few patients who are complicated, have problems that they're not getting help with, and needed other alternatives. 
So we've been able to work with them and they've been very pleased. We've seen great results. Um, let's see, I tend to have a fair number of patients who prefer natural products anyway. Um, some of them don't want to take pharmaceutical med or they want to get off of their pharmaceutical meds or take fewer of those. So those are some of the reasons why we started using this. Now this goes back to the early 1900s where cannabis was actually in the U.S. pharmacopoeia that physicians used and it was a standardly dose product, both hemp and the other. Um, just briefly on the history, I won't go all through that, but cannabis products have been used for thousands of years. They've been used in Chinese medicine. There were even official clinical trials in the 1800s. It was already known that CBD in the 1800s, they didn't know what it was, but it treated seizure disorders. They knew way back then. There was a clinical trial on paper written for that and as a muscle relaxant. Um, it was widely used in the early 1900s, but then you know, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and so forth, we started getting into prohibition. Um, just recently, in 2018, the FDA approved the first CBD medication, which we'll talk about a little bit here in a second. Okay, and I'm not gonna go into a lot about the legislation, but According to the 2018 U.S. Farm Bill, um, all hemp products are legal, and the DEA and the FDA cannot interfere with the transport and sale um, of these hemp products. Okay, so here's uh, just some pictures um, of some greenhouse-grown plants. Um, I had never seen these before until they started growing up. They're huge, just like a giant ficus tree. Um, so hemp grows in a lot of different ways. Sometimes. In some of the older pictures I've seen where it used to be grown in America, it would grow uh, 10 feet tall when they were using it for fiber and make ropes and things like that. But when you're using it for medicinal, they typically keep it a little shorter, but um, still can be quite large. Okay, so here is at the greenhouse that I am helping them with. They are working on product development and trying to develop different strains of the plant. So they, they'll take one plant and they will tweak it depending on how much nutrition they give it, how much sunlight they give it to see if they can affect the different cannabinoids, the ratio of THC and, that, and so forth. So they've got a lot of um, experiments going on there. Um, that is a mature bud that's ready to be harvested. Okay, here's a nice mature bud that's, har that's ready to be harvested and they clip the whole plant off, hang it upside down to dry. And it has to be dried at the perfect humidity and the perfect temperature or it will grow mold. And you don't want to be using mold. Okay. Some basic definitions so that you know what we're talking about when you hear all these different things. <coughs> Industrial hemp is legal. That's anything, any cannabis plant that has less than 0.3% THC. Okay, that's delta 9 THC by dry weight. Okay? Um, when you talk about marijuana, that's anything that has more than 0.3% THC. So that's really a legal definition. Um, the plant looks exactly the same, it smells the same, the only way you can tell it apart is with a lab test. Um, let's see, okay, hemp contains um, hundreds of cannabinoids and terpenoids, so there are literally about three to four hundred chemicals in the plant itself. Um, not just CBD and THC, but many other cannabinoids that we are just learning more and more about. Um, so when you have a, a plant or a full spectrum product, you're going to have a variety of chemicals in there, but it's predominantly going to be CBD. So CBD is what we're mainly talking about. That's cannabidiol. That's the main constituent of industrial hemp. It is not intoxicating. It will not make you high. It does have effects on the brain, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's not intoxicating. It has no abuse potential, and even the FDA agrees with that, and the World Health Organization agrees with that. No abuse potential. Full spectrum hemp. Um, that is hemp that is completely everything that was in the plant to begin with. So it has all the cannabinoids, including CBD and THC, predominantly again just the CBD, along with all the other ones, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, and that typically comes from the flower or what's called the bud. There's another bud picture over there with the little things sticking out of it. Um, raw spectrum hemp. That is Similar to full spectrum, but it's had the THC filtered out, or it's from a plant that doesn't make any THC. Um, CBD isolate is a product that has CBD only. The CBD has been filtered out, and there's no other cannabinoids or anything in it except CBD. Although you can't completely trust, you know, most of the time when somebody says there's absolutely no THC in here, you need to see the labs. 
and you still need to be careful because if, if your work is going to depend on you passing a drug test, you, know, you want to be very careful with that. Um, hemp seed oil is not CBD oil. Hemp seed oil is made from taking the seeds of the hemp plant and pressing them like olive oil. Um, it only is a nutrient-rich oil. It has no medicinal properties. It's just like olive oil. Um, synthetic cannabinoids are um, cannabinoids that are made in the lab. They're not natural. They don't act like natural cannabinoids. They bind receptors much more potently, like 10 times as potent as cannabinoid. And so that can um, lead you to have more side effects. Some of those synthetics are illegal drugs, such as something called Spice or K2, which is a synthetic version of THC that's very dangerous. Um, but then there are some FDA-approved synthetics. There's a medication called Marinol, which is an FDA-approved medication used to treat people with um, AIDS or HIV, um, cancer, when we're trying to get them to gain weight. Um, okay, so our bodies are actually equipped with an entire system just for cannabinoids. So this is called the endocannabinoid system. It was just discovered in the 1990s, so we didn't learn about this in medical school, and I'm not sure if they're teaching it now. Um, this system contains receptors called CB1 and CB2, which are really all over our body, but predominantly you find them in the brain, spinal cord, the peripheral neurons, but really you find them in receptors everywhere. Um, so we were made to interact with cannabinoids. Now we actually make cannabinoids in our body, there's one called anandamide, and you make this cannabinoid when you are jogging or you're happy, it's your happy cannabinoid. So that runner's high, that sense of euphoria comes from that cannabinoid. Um, plant-based cannabinoids are called phytocannabinoids, and that's things anything that comes from a hemp plant. And there are other plants that make cannabinoids. We'll come to that in a second. Um, sometimes people can have a problem with their cannabinoid system, a dysfunction. Symptoms of that can be increased sensitivity to pain, anxiety, depression, brain fog, brain fog chronic inflammation, um, long family history of cancer. Those can be symptoms of a dysregulated endocannabinoid system. Um, one of the head researchers in cannabis research, Dr. McCollum, suggests that perhaps 20% of pharmaceutical medications could be made obsolete if we fully developed cannabis-based products. Okay, um, again, speaking of the system, we talked about the brain and spinal cord. Um, these, since these receptors are pretty much everywhere, there are so many functions in your body that can be affected, uh, such as your thought processes. Um, it even affects the endocrine system with fertility, your appetite. You know, like I said, there was an FDA-approved medication just to stimulate the appetite. Um, pain sensation, particularly neurologic pain, um, mood and memory, and pretty much everything that goes on in the body. Let's see. Okay, so here's here's showing you the the outline of how you got some of these receptors. Just pretty much, they're everywhere. Um, it gets a little more complicated though because, you know, even though we know THC acts on this receptor in the brain and some of these other ones act, act on different receptors, they don't all just stimulate them outright and there are other receptors that they act with that we're not even sure about. Um, for example, we know that cannabidiol also hits serotonin receptors, which is why it helps with depression sometimes. Um, let's see, and other plants that make cannabinoids um, include things like flax, hops, echinacea, and chocolate. So maybe you're craving for chocolate. Well, that's medicinal. Right. need <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> yeah. So some people may be suffering from a deficiency syndrome that is met by the plant. Um, okay. So specifically some syndromes such as PTSD, which we know is a system where everything is vigilant. Your, your system is hypervigilant. That may very well be an endocannabinoid system problem. Okay. I think we mentioned all of this stuff. Lots of chemicals in the hemp plant. Um, these chemicals give it its smell, its color, sort of like essential oils. Those are the, what they call flavonoids, terpenoids, and then we have cannabinoids. The cannabinoids are the medicinal part. Okay, and several FDA approved drugs that are either made from these chemicals or made to look like these chemicals. One, dranabinol, it's been around a long time, that's Marinol. And then Epidiolex is the new one that has been around um, since last year. Um, in Canada, there's a, uh, for their version of the FDA, there's an approved drug called Sativex, which is um, would be considered medical marijuana in the United States, but it's used to treat multiple sclerosis. Um, it is a higher dose of THC, but it's a one-to-one -one ratio, whereas the CBD products mostly here are 20 to 1. They're a good, strong CBD product. Um, 
Okay. So again, I, I mentioned that it's not just CB1 and CB2 receptors, but there are serotonin receptors thought to be involved in some of the processes, maybe even GABA receptors, many different receptors. So it's not, we're not completely clear on the science of how CBD works. Um, it doesn't even necessarily bind things directly. For example, we know that THC stimulates the CB1 receptors in the brain, but CBD is a partial blocker of THC. So it can sort of um, block some of the effects of, of THC, but it still has positive effects on the brain. So it doesn't directly stimulate CB1 the same way the THC receptor does. So a lot to learn there still. Much more research is needed. Okay. <clears throat> there is an effect known as the entourage effect, and you see this a lot actually in alternative and natural medicine. What this means is that when you have a whole plant extract, you seem to get more benefit than just having an isolate. So the whole plant extract or full spectrum products, you have a little bit of everything. You've got predominantly CBD, but you might have a little bit of THC, and you've got all these other cannabinoids. And they actually work together to balance each other out to give you a little bit better relief from whatever your problem is. Um, they help um, each other absorb better, and they can affect multiple targets throughout the body. So when you have a full spectrum of product, we tend to see fewer side effects and you may require four to ten times less product than if you use an isolate product. Um, there's actually a meta-analysis just this past year where they look at multiple studies um, to see this effect. And in the area of seizure disorder, patients who were treated with full-spectrum products, 71% had control of their seizures versus the people with the isolate, only 46% had control of their seizures. It just seemed to work better and they were able to use a much lower dose. Um, so this is, it goes to something called bell curve versus linear, I'll show you that in a second. Some other problems with the isolates, and particularly if it's a synthetic isolate, um, they're going to bind to receptors much stronger than the natural chemical would. Um, so that can give you more side effects um, and may end up with more drug interactions. You can have a loss of balance that you would typically have with your other um, plant chemicals that would be balancing it out. So what you have here, so this is for an isolate. If you have an isolate, you start taking it here, you get to a certain dose where you get your max benefit, and then after that, the more medicine you use, it, it starts to not work as well. Whereas if you have a full spectrum, what they've seen in studies, and this is mostly in animal studies so far, is that the curve just keeps kind of going up. So you don't necessarily, you know, more tends to get better, and you don't necessarily see a drop off like you do with an isolate. <clears throat> okay. So when you have the plant, it starts off raw. When you just have the plant, you cut it, it's a raw plant. Um, it's got all these different chemicals. And these are some of the more important cannabinoids. We're mainly focused on CBD. It's not on this page. We have something in the raw plant called CBDA. That's the acid form. And then these are all these other acid forms as well. Each of these cannabinoids have different chemical properties. Um, and again, that's how they all work together to work better. So in order to have the CBD that's what we think is the most potent right now, um, or the most useful. It has to be heated to a certain temperature to remove the acid from it and create just regular CBD. Okay? So um, the type of CBD you're getting in most of your oils and other products is going to be this type, many more medicinal properties. Um, and these are some of the other cannabinoids. Again, you've got CBG, Delta 9 THC, um, and then these other ones which we will be researching in the future. Okay. Um, why is this a big deal? Why is it important? Why is everybody talking about it right now? Um, it is believed that CBD may be one of the strongest antioxidants we have found so far. Um, it has wonderful anti-inflammatory properties and may protect from free radical damage, oxidative stress, which can help a number of problems from heart disease, brain disease, um, and so forth. Um, so that it has anti-aging properties for those reasons. Um, the U.S. government actually has a patent on cannabidiol that um, says it's a neuroprotectant and it actually may work to help neuroregenerate, according to their patent. Um, let's see. Okay, oh, that's my daughter right there in the front. Okay, beneficial properties. So overall, CBD overall has a calming effect. Um, it is you know, at lower doses for people like maybe with ADD, it can be, you know, calming. It's not necessarily sedating at a lower dose, but we do have people who take higher doses in the evening to help them sleep. Um, 
<clears throat> but if you think of it as calming, it's calming on neurons, nerve cells, mood. Just kind of think of it that way. Um, so it has that pain relief, that anti-anxiety relief, um, anti-convulsant, it calms the brain, um, mood stabilizer, relief of nausea, uh, may even, you know, CBD may suppress the appetite, whereas THC stimulates it. CBD does a little bit more with suppressing it. Um, Anti-inflammatory, anti-ischemic. Okay, here's some of the things that we have used CBD for in our practice. I mean, this is a crazy list. I know mean, this is a lot of stuff. But some of the primary things that we have seen um, benefit for in neurologic pain syndromes, whether it's a diabetic neuropathy or something called RSD, um, or other types of neurologic pain, nerve damage, you know, herniated discs that have nerve pain. Um, it tends to work very well for anything nerve-related. Um, inflammatory or autoimmune diseases. It really works very well with, with those types of diseases. So things like Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis, um, arthritis in general. And even the Arthritis Foundation recently came out uh, discussing CBD and recommending that as an option for people who are interested in that for arthritis. Um, diabetes, I mean, it's, it's obviously not the first thing we go to, but I have seen my patients who are taking it for other reasons, they've had better blood sugar control in their diabetes. Um, I do have, you know, some of my patients who want natural therapies are taking that for my blood pressure. Um, CBD may be very big in um, addiction disorders, so alcoholism, um, tobacco abuse, heroin use. There are clinical trials showing that it helps people um, with their addiction problems. So, very strong use there. Schizophrenia, there is a clinical trial showing that a large dose of CBD can um, calm people with psychosis, that it kind of resets their brain. Cardiovascular disease, ongoing clinical trials using IV CBD after a heart attack, which can maintain up to 50% of cardiac tissue. Um, there are also ongoing clinical trials in stroke, same type of thing, because of these potent anti inflammatory effects. Eczema, we have CBD creams that people use um, on their skin for eczema and acne. My daughter uses the acne cream. Um, asthma and COPD, that will probably be coming in the future. I haven't seen, you know, we don't really have a good inhaler yet, but I'm sure that will be at some point. Osteoporosis, there are studies showing that in fractures and osteoporosis, CBD actually helps heal better than ibuprofen, which is actually no longer recommended when someone has a fracture. Um, we talk about mood disorders like PTSD, depression, anxiety. Um, we have a lot of people who use it for anxiety on an as needed basis. Let's see, epilepsy, that one is even FDA approved for that. ADD, ADHD, and autism. And we'll talk a little bit about autism study briefly. Um, brain disorders in older people like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, multiple sclerosis. Um, I have patients with MS who use CBD and have great results with that. Cancer. Um, Mostly, as far as I know, for the side effects to help mitigate those, although there are some specific cancers that CBD products have been used for um, in a compassionate use type thing. Um, concussions, there's really not a lot of other options for that, so this is one of the things we use. It's a very, very big topic in the NFL and in other you know, football, soccer, hockey, all of those worlds are talking about CBD. Um, <clears throat> insomnia, one of the most common uses, um, of course, nausea and vomiting, interstitial cystitis, because that's more in the family of fibromyalgia and neurologic disorders, so it, it can be helpful with, you know, those type of things as well. So that's just kind of a, a crazy long list. So I talked about, there, there are actually over 20,000 studies on cannabis products. Um, currently, as of like a month ago, there were 207 clinical trials in people going on in a wide range of disorders, including things like um, cardiac disease, stroke, um, various cancer trials, um, concussion trials, autism, epilepsy, so lots of stuff going on there. Okay, and that's just, that, that list of printout as well, so I've wanted it too, but it's just a crazy long list of the clinical trials that are currently ongoing. Because it's so safe, you know, it's really easy to do a clinical trial with it. Um, it's a matter of middle and enough folks for it. Okay. So CBD and adult brain disorders, I'm just going to hit on this briefly, but we won't go into a lot of detail, but there are, there are not currently, other than what's going on in clinical trials, there aren't any completed trials in um, adults. They, there are animal studies that show CBD can improve um, Alzheimer's in, in mice. 
Um, and they actually also have been doing studies with traumatic brain injuries and concussions um, where you get healing of brain tissue when cannabinoids are used. Let's see. Um, strokes, they have they have special type of little mice that they cause to have strokes, and CBD seems to be causing regeneration of brain cells in those mice that are having that problem. Um, there's actually also Parkinson's studies going on as well, and use of CBD for those. It seems to improve um, motor function um, in those mice. All right, autism. There's at least two or three very large autistic studies, 500 children in Israel over two years. 75% um, of children have responded um, in that trial. Not saying that it cures it, but they were able to come off of their um, high potency antipsychotics and all those other awful meds they had to take. 50% um, of the kids in that trial who had comorbid ADHD also um, had help with that. <clears throat> Another trial with 188 um, autistic patients. 30% um, had significant improvement, 53% had moderate, and 6% had slight improvement. That's in behavior, communication, quality of life. And this is a product that is very benign, um, not nearly the side effects as some of those other um, nasty psychiatric medicines. Um, the FDA, like I mentioned earlier, approved a CBD isolate drug. Um, this drug, Epidiolex, actually comes from a plant. So the company is actually growing the plants and isolating the CBD from that. Um, this was in children and adults. Um, the ranges were whopping high baby ranges. So. They took anywhere, based on their weight, anywhere from 100 milligrams to 2,000 milligrams a day, which is a very high dose. Um, they had, even in this study, with an isolate at whopping high doses, they had very minor side effects. And most of these children were on some super toxic drugs. So seizure medicines are some of the most toxic drugs we have. Um, they had, you know, because of this study, we have um, some very good data on drug interactions, and that's in most of our databases now. Um, it makes it a little easier for me to check a patient's drug list when they come in. I can just run it through the database and it pops out, you know, if there's any issues. Um, so, let's go here. Okay, THC. I'm just going to spend one second on that. Everybody has heard about THC. That's the chemical in marijuana that makes people high. Um, they have very high amounts of THC in marijuana plants, um, but in a hemp plant, you have less than 0.3%. It's not enough to make anybody high. <clears throat> in marijuana, um, there can be side effects like palpitations, headaches, dizziness, drowsiness, paranoid thinking, psychosis, those kind of things, but that's only at very, very high doses. So not in your hemp plant. You don't have to worry about that. Um, Problems with pharmaceutical drugs. NSAIDs, that's ibuprofen and leave aspirin. Um, there are about 100,000 people every year that have to be hospitalized because of an NSAID. You just get that under the counter. 15,000 people die from an NSAID. Um, narcotics, of course, you know, 42,000 people died a couple years ago. It's about 50,000 people a year dying from narcotics. Um, that is because narcotics will suppress the respiration center of your brain. CBD does not do that. None of the chemicals in hemp or marijuana will cause your brain to shut off the respiratory center. So there's really, you cannot die from taking hemp from respiratory failure. Um, it would be from narcotics. Um, stimulants, ADHD. So there are 5 million prescriptions written for children um, and adults um, a couple years ago. A lot of those were misused and end up on college campuses or wherever, um, and stimulants actually can cause psychosis. Five million prescriptions, that's quite a bit. Um, tranquilizers, Xanax. Xanax is highly addictive, and that whole family of tranquilizers, sometimes people can have bad reactions to them, they're hard to get off of, um, they can cause all sorts of problems. So um, six million prescriptions a couple of years ago, lots of misuse and diversion with that. Tylenol, you think that's a real safe thing, but I won't let anybody in my family take it. It is the number one cause of acute liver failure with a 27% mortality rate. It causes 10% of the cases of end-stage renal disease. Um, this past year, we came out with some studies that link Tylenol to use in pregnant women and children to autism and ADHD. So it is banned in our household, and I don't recommend any pregnant women or children take acetaminophen. All right, and zero people have died from industrial hemp. The legal dose in animal studies is 500,000 milligrams orally. So you'd have to eat that whole greenhouse <laughs> and um, you'd probably just die from vomiting. Goodness gracious. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
All right, hemp safety. Okay, so we've already had, since the hemp industry kind of exploded a few years ago, over 2 million CBD products sold, um, zero serious adverse events reported. Um, there were about 1,000 out of 2 million non-serious side effects, including nausea, diarrhea, and sedation. Well, sedation is one of the reasons we take it, but um, that's an extremely low rate of adverse events, especially compared to pharmaceutical drugs. Um, doses in recent clinical studies um, have gone even as high as 6,000 milligrams per day with no serious adverse events, and most people won't take nearly that much. Okay, the FDA rescheduled CBD. Um, they used to have on the, the schedule that any hemp products or marijuana products were scheduled one that they had no medicinal use, but as soon as an FDA product came up to be approved, they moved it to schedule five so that it could be prescribed you know, with no problem. So that's on the same level as like codeine cough syrup. Um, they probably should have just descheduled it all together, but they weren't ready to do that yet. Let's see, and the World Health Org Organization agrees that CBD is neither addictive nor harmful. So I do believe that industrial hemp is safer than most over-the-counter prescription medications. So in my practice, um, I have at least 300 patients who have told me that they've tried a CBD product or they've asked me for help with that. Um, as a result, they have been able to come off of whopping high doses of Xanax, Ativan, sleeping pills, anxiety medications, antidepressants, pain medications. Those are some of the most common things that we can get rid of. Um, in my practice, we've used it for smoking cessation, high blood pressure, ADHD, concussions, interstitial cystitis, acne, and we kind of went through that list earlier. Um, side effects. Occasionally, if you have a patient who kind of has an unhealthy lifestyle or they're a smoker, um, they may be more likely to have um, some what we call detoxification reaction, like headaches initially, if they, especially if they start with a really high dose, or even diarrhea or acne. Um, CBD sometimes has a detoxifying effect on the body, so as they kind of clean up their lifestyle a little bit, they have a little bit less likelihood of that happening. Um, another way to avoid that is just to start low and go slow um, and, you know, clean up your lifestyle a little bit. Let's see. Okay. So here are some of my patients. Um, teenager with RSD, which is a neuropathic pain disorder. That can be a very severe, painful disorder where people actually commit suicide because they can't get pain relief. So she was taking 2,400 milligrams of ibuprofen every day, which is a whopping high dose of ibuprofen. Um, for years, and when I saw her, I was like, um, where I, you know, her mother knew she was taking that much, and she still was not getting any pain relief. So this is a neurologic type of pain that's not really addressed by anything else. I started her on one drop three times a day. She was pain-free in a week, doesn't take ibuprofen anymore, and after a couple of months, she was able to stop the CBD and the pain was gone. Now, she will occasionally get a flare, like every few months, and then she'll go back to taking a few drops for a few days, and then it's gone again. So that, I believe, actually healed her or met a need that she had with this RSD. Um, a 60-year-old gentleman, patient of mine with chronic shoulder pain, he has a lot of other issues like diabetes and insomnia. He used to take a ton of tramadol and Xanax and his wife had complained that his, his brain was not working right um, and he was um, getting lost and having issues. So we <coughs> were able to get him on CBD and he titrated off of 360 pills a month. And he's completely off of all his pain medicines, all his anxiety medicines, and he doesn't even use it every day now. So that took probably six to nine months to come off of all those things which he wanted to do. And now he doesn't have any pain. His mood is fine. Um, he uses CBD products on occasion. He doesn't even have to take them every day now. So um, much more mental clarity. And he recently told me that um, he was noticing improvement in his blood sugar when he did use his CBD. So he was going to start taking it more regularly to try to get, you know, some better blood sugar numbers. Um, let's see, knee pain. So a seven-year-old with um, arthritis. Um, we started with that patient with a transdermal cream. They get pretty much instant relief. And we're, a lot of times with our older patients, we're trying to avoid NSAIDs because we don't want to damage their kidneys um, or they, we don't want them bleeding or having a heart attack. Those are all bad outcomes. Um, so that works very well. Now, if they have pain all the time, they probably need to be on a sublingual or some kind of oil as well. Um, let's see here. Okay, I have a 30-year-old patient who had severe chronic pain due to a genetic disorder. 
who was taking 64 milligrams of dilaudid extended release, which is a whopping high dose of narcotics. Um, but he really didn't want to be on that. Every time I saw him, he was sort of like a zombie. Um, and we started him on CBD products, and he got completely off of the extended release dilaudid. And now he takes a few breakthrough oxycodone, but this is way less than what he used to take. Um, enough so that he's awake now, and he hasn't been awake in like 20 years, or you know, how old is he now? 30, oh, 15 years. He's had this chronic genetic disease. So um, he has a new lease on life because of his CBD use. Um, my MS patient, um, she's had a dramatic response. Um, she, her MS got worse, and she came home one day to where her right side just wasn't working, and that's the way MS goes. It's just relapsing like that. And so she started using CBD products, and just within about five minutes, she was able to use her arm again. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but MS is kind of a crazy disease like that. So um, she really does like that. Now, CBD doesn't work for everybody. You know, there's different sources to people's problems. So if your source is related to some kind of dysfunction in the ECS, then it may help you. Um, some people don't use a high enough dose, or they don't use it frequently enough, or they don't use it long enough and give it time. Like with, like maybe that little first little girl, it took about three or four days before she said, okay, now my pain's gone. So it takes a little time to kick in. It may not work instantly. Oh, that's my office staff. This is my husband with the hair there. They don't always dress like that, though. Anyway. Okay, um, drug interactions. Um, let's see. So, for the most part, CBD is not a problem with most medications. Now, if you're taking a medication that is dangerous in and of itself, like Coumadin, or something for your heart that is, like if you've got a very irregular heart rhythm and you need a strange um, cardiac arrhythmia medicine, those need to be checked by a doctor. Um, but most medications it's not a problem for, which is why the FDA has not had a fit about it being available you know, over the counter. Um, not an issue. And at the dose that most people use it, it's not an issue either. In these trials that they've had, they've been using very, very large doses with um, other toxic medications and still not seeing any problems and have anybody die. So um, if you're on a bunch of medications, you really ought to have a doctor run the interactions. But otherwise, you know, it's not an issue with, with most minor medications. Um, let's see. So if I have a patient who's not on a blood thinner, a seizure medicine, or a cardiac arrhythmia medicine, pretty much everything else is, is okay. Um, I might have them watch for side effects that they would normally expect from that medication. For example, if they're on an antidepressant like Zoloft or Prozac or Lexapro, I will tell them to watch out for side effects from that you would typically expect with Zoloft, Lexapro in that class, which can include serotonin symptoms like flushing or diarrhea or rapid heartbeats. But I really haven't had anybody complain of any of those things. Um, sometimes we might lower the dose if there haven't been any side effects for those. Um, Wellbutrin, which I'll come to on the next page, is one that I have to be very careful with. I don't usually prescribe Wellbutrin with CBD, or I use a very low dose with that. Um, I don't use Depakote as one of the medications I watch out for. I never use Depakote with CBD. But very few people take that. They're either, that's a seizure medicine. So again, I put that up there with seizures and arrhythmia medicines. People with those drugs know they're not supposed to take other things without talking to their doctor. Um, <coughs> statins, very common. Most of them do not cause a problem. Sometimes um, there's certain statins like Zocor, which they tell you you can't eat grapefruit with. CBD has some of the same interactions that grapefruit has. So it, it still has not been a problem. Your doctor, if you're on a statin, should be monitoring your liver test anyway because, you know, that's what they do on statins. So you shouldn't see any issues. Let's see, epidolics. Let's We talked about that a little bit. Okay, so um, the drugs that would cause CBD to be increased are not going to hurt you. So that's not really a problem. Okay, what we get here is from this epidolics study, there were certain drugs that we do have to watch out for. They're all seizure medicines or antiarrhythmics for blood thinners. That's pretty much it. Um, Depakote was the worst one, so I'm always very careful with that, but that's pretty much it. Um, caffeine, you know, if you use a ton of caffeine, you might notice some more caffeine side effects, but otherwise it's not usually a big deal. Wellbutrin, you know, I'd probably use a lower dose if I'm gonna use Wellbutrin, um, but the rest of them, you know, are not 
that big a deal and you won't be using high enough dose of CBD for it to be an issue. So like Amy had mentioned earlier, things you have to consider when you're looking at a product. Um, agricultural practice. Um, so this is a product grown either in greenhouses or fields. If it's grown in a field, it's going to draw heavy metals from the ground. You're going to have pesticide drift from other fields. Um, it can get fungus or mold if it's not stored at the right humidity. Processing. There's a lot of different ways you can process it. Once it goes from the field, it can either be processed by a method called CO2 extraction or they can use alcohol extraction. And they both have legitimate reasons to be processed that way. There's some studies showing that there are benefits to either way. So I don't think either way is bad. But if you use an alcohol, you have to make sure it's all gone. If it has, if your product has an alcohol taste or smell, then it might not all be gone. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you something called a COA that you can look at and make sure it's safe. Um, but if you put it on your tongue and it burns, that's not good. So burning is not good. Um, <clears throat> food allergies um, should not be an issue, but if you know you're allergic to tree nuts, <coughs> you probably need to avoid tree nuts, right? So um, certificate of analysis, we're gonna talk about that. Um, organic is ideal. Um, USDA certification is just starting since it was legalized in 2018, so there's very few companies that have that yet because it's just starting up. Um, sometimes your hemp may be labeled as coming from Europe. I really wouldn't buy anything that's not made in the United States because when it says it's coming from Europe, it might actually be from China or Mexico, and they don't have any regulations on what they can spray on their hemp in those countries, so I would not trust it. Um, I would typically buy US made products. Um, okay, uh, purchasing from a reputable hemp company is always a good plan. All right, this is what you're looking for. You want to see a lab certificate, whether it's your pharmacist or whether you can zap with your phone, a little code on there. There's a something called a QR code. Sometimes you can zap those and it'll pull up this lab certificate. And it's important that it not be just something that says ABC Hemp Company and then they list out these things. They could just make that up on their laptop. So you really want to see it coming from a real lab that's, that they don't own. So Proverde is who did this certificate. Um, so that's ideal. It's called third-party labs. <clears throat> what we're looking at here, this is typically what the first page looks like. It'll list all the different cannabinoids. And over here is the ND is none detected. Okay. And what we're really looking for is the max CBD, which is going to be down here on the bottom. In this product, it had 52 milligrams per milliliter, and that should match your bottle. So, like these bottles here. 750 has the 50. Yeah. I'm sorry, one, uh, the 1500. Yes. Yeah. So, like these bottles here have, they say right on the front, 50 milligrams per milliliter. And as long as this got on that bottom line, you know, around 50 milligrams per milliliter, <laughs> then you know you're getting what you think you're getting. Um, this also gives you the amount of THC which has two milligrams per milliliter. And it tells you down here the ratio is 25 to one. So you have 25 CBD to um, one THC. So that is a legal product. Um, and you want to be able to see those. And if the seller won't show them to you or they're not posted, you can request it. But I always, you know, before we purchase CBD products, I look for that. Let's see, now page two of this, which I don't have on here, um, looks for pesticides, heavy metals, and fungus. So you really need to see that as well. I have had some farmers that have actually brought me their COAs and their product. And I'm like, that's great, but I, you know, and I love you, but I'm not taking that product because you didn't bring me the pesticide report. You know, because I want to know, you know, what kind of pesticide was on it or what kind of fungus or heavy metals. And so the second page is nice to see as well. So I would look for that as well. So that's not a problem with the greenhouses. Um, for sure, the pharmacy is stored, huh? Pardon? The brochure. The brochure. The COA you would either get on the website. Yep, on the website of the company, or on sometimes the, if you're buying your product at a pharmacy, they'll probably have them on file. Okay. Yeah. So like at my office, when I before I buy products, I um, we carry CBD products, and before I buy them, I've seen the COAs, and I know what a reputable company is. And but I have people come in all the time, and they say, I bought this at the gas station, and I'm like. Oh, that's just not a good idea. But ooh, I'll look it up on the internet and see, you know, what it is. And it's, you know, I'm like, okay, here's why I probably wouldn't use this. I mean, it might be okay, but it might also have lead in it. It might have all these things in it. So I'm just very hesitant. It, there is a way to look for those things, but a lot of times you can't find them. Um, okay, let's see. Chemical properties. So we talked about a lot of this already. Let's see. Okay, some of your products 
they're going to be in different bases. So um, the cannabinoids are an oil-based product, so it's going to typically be in an oil of some sort. So I believe we're using some coconut MCT. or MCT. We're using MCT oil. Sometimes people will use hemp seed oil or olive oil, and that may affect the taste, but it's going to be in an oil typically. There are some products that are water-based, but they're mostly isolates. Um, okay, so there'll be different bases. Um, the best way to take it, which we're getting ready to come to, is probably sublingual. Um, once you swallow it, there's something called the first pass effect where it has to go through the liver and it does all this digesting and you kind of lose a large amount of your benefit that way. Um, okay, so sublingual transdermal is also a great route because you, it doesn't get digested. It just goes straight to the problem. So if you have a knee problem or an elbow problem, you just rub it right there and you get that effect immediately as it goes through the tissue. Okay, here's some of the, any way you can think of to get it to your body, it probably already is on the market. Um, inhaled is one way people get it in. I don't know, does anybody want to hear anything about inhaled or not really? No, okay. Um, sublingual is the most common, it's the most convenient. Um, it's not always the best absorbed, but it is probably the easiest to do. And that's, that's your, where you're going to um, probably have the most of your time. A lot of CBT products out there, um, especially the early ones, tasted awful. And um, these taste so much better. Um, I helped develop the local products, and I don't know, I think the reason these older companies didn't make them taste any better was because it cost more money to do that. All they had to do was put them through one little more step refinement to remove the chlorophyll, and it tastes so much better. Um, so that's kind of a common issue there. Um, typically, you put it under your tongue, you let it sit for you know, a couple of minutes before you swallow it, because you want most of your absorption to happen in your mouth as much as possible. That will onset in about 5 to 15 minutes, and it will last 3 to 4 hours. So you can't expect to take it in the morning before it lasts all day long. You know, you're going to have to redose like 3 times a day. That's very inconvenient, but um, that's what you get with the sublingual. Um, there are other um, ways you can take CBD in. You know, there's capsules and gummies. Um, gummies are not currently legal in North Carolina. You might see them everywhere, but they're not legal. But anyway. <clears throat> so. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the state of North Carolina doesn't want gummies out there because of the risk of children taking them, although nothing's really going to happen to them other than they might, you know, kind of get sick from eating so much sugar. Um, transdermal is really nice. I love patches. Um, this is a great option for extended release. You can put the patch directly on the area that's bothering you, but you're also going to get some systemic absorption. And the absorption through the skin is very good. So the patches are a little bit more expensive, but sometimes they can last up to three days. So an older person, you might get three days out of one patch, which is a pretty good deal. Um, I have some younger people that are using patches because they can't redose at school. So if, like, if I have a teenager who has bad anxiety, but we don't want to put them on, their mom doesn't want them on a drug, they don't, we can't give them benzo, um, they can use like either a quarter of a patch, and that will give them 12-hour control at least all day because the schools won't dose it for you. So they'll give other ADHD medicines, but they won't give a CBD product. Um, creams we sort of talked about. Typically, that most creams do skin things. You will get some joint absorption, which is nice. So, um, And then, of course, they're rectal and vaginal suppositories, but I think that'll be kind of messy. All right, now, um, standard dosing. All right, so <clears throat> kind of the amount you use depends on what your problem is, okay? If you're older, you probably want to start really low. If you're you know, very young, I'd still start low. Middle age, you can kind of start with an average dose. So you know, maybe like a 40-year-old might do 25 milligrams at bedtime if they're having trouble with sleep. Um, these droppers we designed so that they are marked, right? Yes. So these droppers, are, and when we have a 50 milligram per milliliter product, they have a quarter, a half, see. three quarters, and a whole so that you know how much you're getting in there. Um, so typically, I recommend people start with 25 milligrams at bedtime if they're using for insomnia. If they are, and usually you want to be home when you're trying it, you don't want to be out or anything. It's going to wear off, you're not going to have a hangover the next morning. Um, if you need to take it during the day, you're going to want to start with the lower milligrams because you don't want to be sleepy, especially when you take it for the first time because it may have the most profound effect when you take it the first time. So you might want to start at bedtime and then Next, you want to add a daytime dose if you're needing it during the day. So like one to three milligrams, which may just be a few drops if it's a concentrated product. Um, and you might have to do that three times a day. 
And you want to kind of take notes of how you feel, if you have any side effects, like if it makes you sleepy or anything like that. And then you can increase the dose and you can feel safe increasing that without worrying that you're going to kill yourself. Like I said, it will not suppress respiration. Um, and, you know, I have pain patients that are on whopping high doses. So we've never seen any problems with it. Let's see. That's kind of standard dosing. And it's in that booklet, the exact same thing we just went over. Um, you can do something called microdosing. <clears throat> this one is a little more tedious, and I don't really recommend this, but like you start with one drop, and then you can take it up to two, and so let's just not go over that one. Um, but that is an option. It's also described in that booklet. Um, again, you know, sometimes very low doses work well, so it just depends. If you're an older person, like my mother, she's 75-ish, she takes one drop, oh, it made me dizzy. I can't do it. I'm like, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> but so she, you know, just be home when you do it and start slowly and work your way up. I mean, I have people who just take one drop and that works for them. And, you know, it may be a homeopathic thing where it's, it's kind of working the way homeopathic medicine does. But you can increase it freely without feeling like you're going to have problems. If you have a job where they're going to drug test you, you need to talk to your human resources department before you take a CBD product. Because most CBD products will turn drug test positive if you take enough of it for long enough. Um, at my practice, I give my patients letters that say, I recommend a CBD product. They may have a positive drug test because that's what we do when they have, when they're on ADHD medicines or if they're on chronic pain medicines, they get a letter that because it's going to show up on a drug test. Um, but you have to ask HR first before you do that. There's some um, programs like truck driving that's a big no-no. They will not let you take a CBD product. Even the THC-free products, I, you know, I would still be... CBD can still turn drug test positive even if it has no THC in it. It is still possible. So if your job depends on it, you have to be very careful there. Um, if you have been taking it a while, you may want to take a drug holiday. That means take a few days off. And you might even be able to go back to a lower dose. And with some of my patients, um, like that young lady with the pain disorder, you know, after she'd been taking it a few months, she stopped it and her pain was gone. So, you know, once you meet that deficiency that you might have, um, you might not have to take it every day. And then it might just be on an as-needed basis. So you can always try that. Um, let's see. And you can try different forms. So if one product doesn't work for you, you may, you may try switching brands. Because when you switch brands, you're going to a different strain of hemp, usually. Um, or you may switch products or use combination. Like you might use oil, sublingual, and a roll-on or a lotion. You know, um, so you can add different forms in there, more than one. Let's see. Okay, masking taste. This is for bad tasting products. This one is not a bad tasting product, but some of the earlier ones tasted horrible, like you're out in the pasture chewing on grass or something. Um, and so people would try every trick under the sun to make those taste better. All right, so um, insurance companies. Well, right now it's not covered by insurance. And, the, you know, I suppose if you have a seizure disorder, they might cover epidiolex but they're not covering um, CBD products. Now, I don't know if you can use your HSA for it. I think that depends on your own, whatever your plan is, as far as what supplements they will allow you to pay for. Um, there is a push from some of the pain management specialists to try to get insurances to cover that, but you know, we'll see how that goes. Okay, and then um, questions. I'll answer specific questions if I have anything. Yes. Do you recommend, like, if, if it's external pain, do you recommend the creams and lotions over the, the drops type things? I think it's a good thing to start with a cream or a lotion if you have an external source of pain, like if you have a knee or an elbow. Sometimes that's a nice place to start where you're comfortable with it and the, the treatment goes right there. You're still going to get some absorption. You still could have a positive drug test if you were if that dependent on that. But that's a good place to start. Now, you said with statin, it could interfere with that? even with I probably the wouldn't worry about it with the topical. Topical, okay. Yeah. What do you call a real high dose of statin? A real high dose of statin? No, I was talking about a real high dose of CBD. I mean, I know oh. most statins, the doctors try to push the doses up to the max dose. So, you know, if you were taking like 50 or 200 milligrams of CBD in a day, then you would need to still monitor your liver function, particularly if it was so cool. For people who have Parkinson's, I would probably start with just a few drops, like or even up to a quarter of a drop or at bedtime, and then slowly add some daily doses. Sir? About 25 milligrams. About 25 milligrams, I would start with, well, I'd probably start a little, even a little smaller than that in the, the evening, but then I would take it up to three times a day. Yep, so I'd start with a, like maybe even less than a quarter of a dropper, and it's got little marks on it, so before it gets the first line, 
for really an older person in the evening and then add some so daily doses. Is to sell this product to independent pharmacies because you have the pharmacists in there that can give you some of this dosing information and you know if you're not going directly to Dr. Parker so they can give you some you know and it's just a it's a quality product quality products tend to be a little bit more expensive um, but at least you have the security of knowing that what you're taking is some of the best product on the market. Yeah. This particular product has been out for about eight months, but this company that is growing our hemp has been around for 35 years. They've been growing, um, cultivating products in greenhouses, so they're expert farmers. Um, and our where we do our extracting and processing of the hemp plant is our company, so we're vertical, so every single aspect is all together, you know, we're not sort outsourcing any of our um, operation to a third party. Sorry. Uh -huh. How does it work so quickly? Um, well, for one thing, if you're if you've never used hemp products and you're deficient, your body's going to be like waking up. So it's it's just astoundingly new. Um, so for some people, like I said, if they have you know nerve damage, it may take three or four days before they start noticing that oh my pain is gone. Mm -hmm. So. Now, how it works so quickly, I mean, how does ibuprofen work? When you take that, it works in about 30 minutes. The same thing, it's very potent, anti-inflammatory, binds those receptors. This is how I explain it, and tell me if you think I'm right or not. Because as she was explaining that you have this endocannabinoid system in your body, which is basically, as she was saying, the system that we've only discovered in 1990, and they explain it that it keeps, it's like your balancing system. There are lots of different systems in your body. This is what keeps your balance. And the body produces cannabinoids already. So I explain it sort of like in layman's terms. So any stress that you have on the body is going to deplete this ECS system and deplete the cannabinoids that you have in your body. So when you're, it's like, Filling up your gas tank. Yeah, it's ready and waiting for some relief that you haven't, that your body hasn't been providing.